Women Matters, still in January 23. About artificial intelligence today. We will see which will come, what will come out. How can we distinguish who is writing what we are reading, a bot or a person? That might be one of the questions before the check-in. And Monia, you were the first one to arrive. Yeah. I'm in Vienna and it's getting colder and it's getting wintry because it the birds sounded like spring all week long and today I put out more nuts and uh, so they and the squirrels have been very busy collecting them so it's probably getting cold for a couple of weeks and of course Austria needs the snow because we have all this skiing business let's call it a business and if people don't come, so that's really, but uh, as, as a whole, uh, skiing will probably, the skiing industry will probably have to reduce. It's just, uh, yeah, there isn't much snow anymore. Anyway, I'm relatively fine. Um, I had a very strange, conversation for three, two or three hours in a dark room, <laughs> in an almost dark room this afternoon, or this noon actually. Uh, and what I really am wondering is if people, once they are set on a certain train, uh, they keep on that going there and they can't obviously change and be in the moment where they are right now. This is one of the questions I had. Anyway, um, so I'm in a mixed mood, let's put it this way. Uh, I pass on to Christine. Um, hello, this is Christine from Carlsbad, California. Um, yeah, I've, I've definitely gotten used to it being a new year. Um, the idea of, you know, planning for the year and looking ahead and seeing what wants to emerge, what wants to be accomplished, uh, what wants to arise it has been coming up in various uh, groups. Um, and we will see, right, uh, to be <laughs> to be discovered. Um, Tom has been suffering from sciatica for the past week and a half to the point, I mean, he's always had sciatica that comes and goes, but it's usually very brief. You know, it will last what, a few days. And what's it, that? What's that? Sciatica is that nerve that runs down the length of your leg that can get irritated and it flares up with pain. Um, usually. Yes, yes. It's in, 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 in. German issues, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Mm. Usually temporary, comes and goes, but um, this has persisted. And sometimes he can't walk because uh, the muscle, I guess, tightens around it to protect it. And then he can't move his leg. So he's gone to the doctor. He's going to get conservative treatment to start with, um, like physical therapy, and then move up maybe to some injections and see where things head, but just conservative for, for the time being. Um, so hopefully that, that has put a damper on things. He needs some help getting around, uh, and it's unpredictable. He's fine. And then if the muscle spasms, then he can't walk all of a sudden. So that's kept us occupied. And, uh, what else? Rain. I mentioned that it's been raining crazily, but fortunately being in Southern California, most of the rain already is dumped by the time it hits land because California moves quite a bit uh, east at the bottom at our corner of California. It's, it's east. So everything to the west has really gotten most of the rain. And uh, but still, there's a, a little starting to accumulate some flooding and uh, concerned because we're still going to get more rain. But um, we're up on a hill, so we're pretty good. Um, what else? Um, I think that's about it. Uh, can't really think of anything else in particular going on. So I will turn it over to Hanley. 
Hello, everyone. I'm in Cape Town at the moment, and it's really hot here today. So I'm a bit tired, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's because it's humid. Because we're at the at the coast, it the the UV UV rates are just sky high, and to be outside is not good. So today, I really feel like oh. <laughs> totally against what I usually feel like, and it's also okay to feel like this. But it's you're getting used to this type of heat. Um, because February and March is actually the hottest months of the year here. It can go up to 40 degrees and the likes. And because of the humidity, it's really, it's different from Johannesburg at 40 degrees, just to give a comparison. Uh, Monia, I love what you just said about both the, the chat GPT and open AI, and also what you said about when people are stuck on their views, because I was just made aware of a book by Anand Giri Haradas. I don't know if I even pronounce it correctly. And it's about the art of persuasion uh, in a polarized world. But the book's title is The Persuaders at the Center of the Fight for Hearts, Minds, and Democracy. So I just read something he wrote. Uh, he wrote an article about it. So I just started reading that just before we came together. And the, at the same time, I was also made aware of a documentary, an old documentary by Adam Curtis about this the century of self. And it's based on how Freud's um, theories were used to have power over people during mass democracy. So I started watching it on YouTube, just the first 30 minutes. Of, it's more than three hours long, the total series. And it was just fascinating how this other gentleman called Edward uh, Brains, how he just hijacked um, or used and applied Freud's theories to have control over mass democracy at the time in the in the States, in the US. So I just started watching it, so it's very interesting. And also, I when you st start speaking about the chat, the AI, a friend of mine from the States just posted something on Facebook where he asked the AI about uh, what's the difference between coaching facilitation, training, teaching, leadership, and the likes, mentoring and the likes. And the, and the um, response that came back from the AI was quite interesting because it was actually spot on. But again, it's amazing how it just draws it so quickly and it's, you know, it's boosted pu it out, but I won't go into that yet. But it was just, it, this literally happened in the last two hours where I came upon these. So I thought the synchronicity is quite extraordinary. Um, we'll be passing on to Beatrice. Hi. We're um, still, we're still sort sorry. of in the, in, in check-in, and we we were talking about the AI, and we will develop the topic later. So you just tell us what has happened. You don't have to dive into the topic yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was ready to though, um, Hanali, because I in September I think it was yeah in September I did a project that was all about what you're talking about. So I guess we will talk about that later. Um, let's see, in the last two weeks, what has happened? I'm back in Portland. Um, we got back uh, about a, just a little over a week ago. Um, it's a hard adjustment. <laughs> um, because I, I mean, I, it's very, it's very lovely here and very quiet here. There's a lot of space, but um, I don't really know people here yet. And I don't really have a routine here yet. And I hadn't been here long enough to establish those things. So I have to kind of reestablish all of that, um, which is a hard thing to do. Um, also having a lot of space means that you, feel the feelings that you've been uh, <laughs> putting underneath. Um, I think this year is going to be a year of processing a lot of grief and feelings and things that I have kept myself very busy to avoid for years. And I think I finally have the, the space to sit with them, um, whether I like it or not. <laughs> which is good it's important and I think I'll feel better at the end of it all and um but it's 
yeah, so that's, I've been having a lot of feelings. Um, what else is new? That's about it. I don't know. I'm still working on the projects I'm working on. Um, I'm still working part-time for the online dance community, and I'm still working on uh, the morning machine project in New York. I'm going to go at the end of February to work on it for about three weeks. Um, and yeah, that's it. Did everyone else go? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's me now. We also will have some colder days, but not really cold. Maybe it will be zero centigrade at night, but not, not really freezing. And I hope it will continue this week, uh, these next weeks. Yesterday, I got a huge amount of wood, so we should be fine. And nothing really very important happened. I mean, life goes on and nice. Oh, for the topic which Monia was saying, I just yesterday, I watched a talk by Watzlawick, and it was about more or less why you can't uh, uh, convince somebody else who is in, in their binary of thought, you know, that it's his, I don't know if you know him, Paul Watzlawick, he, he wrote the, uh, the book, um, uh, a guideline, I don't know how it's called in English, but the guideline of uh, becoming unhappy. So uh, yeah, how real is real, he wrote that. So how real is real and yeah. yeah. Uh, Anleitung zum yeah, unglücklich sein. Yeah, Anleitung zum unglücklich sein, genau. It it was for me. It was eye opening because yeah. I can I can tell you the little story. It's very very short. There are two neighbors, and one needs a hammer because he wants to do something, and he knows the neighbor has the hammer, and so he thinks, oh, I go over there and ask for the hammer. Then he thinks, oh, the neighbor lately he didn't say hello to me anymore. And then uh, he built up his mind with what the neighbor might uh, have done to him or might think or whatever and ever. And when he finally went, he went, uh, knocked at the door and said, oh, no, no, oh, God, my dogs. And uh, when the neighbor opened, he said, keep your damn hammer. <laughs> you know, so your own mind construction uh, creates these things and the other person doesn't even know about all the things, you know. So this is his way of becoming uh, unhappy. So when you follow these guidelines and you can be sure not to become very happy. But uh, yesterday it was about, about this topic. I can give you the link and uh, also you... Uh, all of you, you can send us the links of these important things that would be good in the chat. Yeah, that's me. And uh, yeah, let's go on. Tell me about this AI. I, I only the thought, you know, even if you get wonderful answers, but they can be manipulated and you don't, and you believe all the stuff what, what people tell you. And we slowly will forget to think by ourselves. I see that very dangerous. <laughs> uh, we asked, or the, the person I told you about who is rather sophisticated about asking, he asked the program, are you, is there an ideology behind your answers? And the program answered, well, I am just a computer program. I don't have any ideology, but it might be that the people who programmed me, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite, it's funny, it's, it's, yeah. But this is what I was trying to uh, bring across that, how can you, because the answers are very sophisticated and they are well phrased because it's a, it's a language program as well. So it speaks in German as well as in, and German is hard, you know. So it speaks German and English and any, any language. And that's amazing to me too. Uh, how do you notice that it's an artificial intelligence behind what you read? And does it matter? That's also the question. <laughs> When, when are we getting suspicious of artificial intelligence? I've read a science fiction story where an artificial intelligence finally takes over the world and everything is fine. So um, I'm wondering. So. <laughs> uh, Beatrice, you said you had this topic already a couple of months ago or? 
Um, it wasn't AI specifically, but it was the the Century of Self documentary, Hanalei, that you talked about was one of our main sources. We, I don't know if I mentioned this project when I was doing it, um, but the same group that I'm working on with the Morning Machine project has another project that they just started in September um, called the PR Seder, Public Relations Seder. And the, the project idea is we're taking the format of a Jewish Seder to unpack and unravel and challenge the history of public relations. And, and the, you know, the original Seder is about um, freedom from oppression and about community coming together and kind of understanding and, and healing from the trauma and hardship from being oppressed and celebrating that freedom and also forgiving the oppressors. I mean, that there's all this language in the Seder. And so for the project, we, we did a, we read a real Seder um, a number of the project leaders are Jewish, so this is you know from their cultural background and their tradition. Um, and then the other one of the project leaders is also doing his he's doing his dissertation on the history of public relations. And so um, we read the we watched we watched the first part of that documentary, Century of Self, and we talked about you know the manipulation of marketing and PR and all these things that you know, tell us what we need and, and manipulate how we think and, you know, what would it look like to separate from that? And, and um, so it was very interesting. I mean, it was the very early stages and, and I'm not, I'm no expert on it. I mean, I watched that part of that documentary and talked a bit at the project about it, but I thought it was very interesting. And I was also very shocked to realize that a lot of the consumeristic and capitalistic things that feel so part of our, so inherent to our culture are actually like only a century old um, or less, I think. They're, like it's, it's like, it hasn't been that long <laughs> that we've been behaving this way and that, that it wasn't that long ago that we were not behaving this way. And that was shocking to me because it feels so ingrained that it, it felt like it's been something we've been doing forever as a society. So um, yeah, and then I also wanted to share um, one of the collaborators on the other project, um, her name is Mara uh, Einstein, um, Omera, I think is how she pronounces her name. Um, but she, she worked in marketing and commercial spheres for a long time and then left and became an academic and an activist and has written books now about the power of marketing um, to manipulate and to kind of unravel and unpack that. So that's, this is her list of books. I mean, I haven't read any of her books, but I've worked with her on the Morning Machine Project and she's an amazing person um, and had a lot of great insights. So I'll, that's, that's all I had to share on that for the moment. Monia, were, were you referring to people changing their behavior or people changing their minds? In what, re in what respect? Uh, I don't know what you are quoting, but... You, you were bringing up the idea of getting people to see things differently or do things differently yeah, at the beginning. Yeah. And I wasn't sure if you were talking about behavior change or thinking. Beliefs, belief how do you How do you differentiate? I mean, you think and your behavior is a certain, you have a certain kind of behavior. Well, the change process I think would be different if you're trying to change a behavior, which is more of a habit and develop a new behavior, but changing thinking is a little harder to yeah. do. To, to do that but behavior change is also very hard. It's, it's just a little bit more concrete and objective ways to well, do that what i was trying to get across is to get someone to change the way they hold themselves their position and just see if this would have an effect 
on his mind. Oh. Because he was sitting there, uh, legs crossed, arms crossed. And I was just sitting there open and I was wondering how can we have an open dialogue if someone just sits like this. It finally ended up that we changed our chairs, uh, which helped me, but, and a little bit it helped him too, but still, um, yeah. It's very hard. We are, uh, we will be doing, uh, uh, what is his name? Keith Martin Smith. Uh, He's Martin Smith when the Buddha needs therapy. And this also, uh, you can be very meditative, really, uh, very high on your meditative line. And still you are standing in your own way. Like this is when all the gurus mistreated their pupils and uh, took advantage of them. Uh, so to be aware of what you think while you are thinking it, when you are thinking it. This is really one of the, so to really be in the here and now and notice what your body does and what your mind does. Uh, that's a very, very wide field. And I'm just really, yeah, to be confronted with it the way I was with someone who is very experienced in meditating and yeah. Anyway, this will be I a topic to come for quite in some here. Time. I think of my own experience when I'm very tight in the shoulders. You know, for a while, I was like this, and it feels like you are constricted. And I'm quite sure that that is also uh, transporting itself to the mind. And then you you cannot, you know, it's all like in binaries. And as soon as you, I'm doing now a lot of exercises and so on, it feels much more open and I feel more open. I mean, I haven't a scientific proof that I'm more open in my mind, but I have the feeling that, that I'm more receptive, I would say, and more maybe also tolerant or something like this, you know, but when you are like this, you are like, <laughs> like German, you know. <laughs> but it took me some time to notice uh, what he expressed in his, in the way he held his arms and hands. And, uh, and I'm used to it because it's not something new. It was a deja vu. And I don't know whether I was very polite, but I said, this is boring for me. <laughs> But you know, I did singing, as you know, no. And at mm. the, the certain point when I was young, and I went to 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 auditions, and somebody told me, "But how are you standing? You know, how are you? Is your posture?" And I wasn't aware of it. And then I worked on it, and then also the voice comes different. So mm. everything mm. I think is connected with uh, how you treat your body and how you are feeling inside of your body. So, what what does the dancer say to this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, I mean, that's why I dance. That's why I became a dancer um, was because I needed somewhere to put the feelings. Um, maybe it's also why I'm having trouble right now because I'm not dancing. Um, yeah. I think movement and the body are huge. And I think there's been a, you know, there's a lot of discourse. Well, there was a lot of discourse about mind body separation for a long time. I think now the whole world is shifting the perspective on that. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's completely wrong to think that they're separated. And, and, you know, the level of awareness may differ and you know, I, but I also think, you know, I don't know. I, I've, I've also had experiences of my body feeling weird 
on an anniversary of a death or something. And before I've even consciously remembered the death, my body's already feeling weird. And I noticed that first. And then I realized, oh, look at the calendar. Look what day it is. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, it's the book, the book that I've tried to read a million times and I want to, I will, some, someday I'll get through the body keeps the score is all about that. I don't know if, if who's read that in this group, but um, it's, I've heard great things about it and I've wanted to keep reading it and it's, but it's very dense and it's been hard to, you know, I get through a few chapters and then I put it down and I get distracted by other things, but, um, but the whole and, premise. And it's trauma is, focused. It's very trauma focused. Yeah. Yeah. Which is hard to read. It's trauma focused and, and you know, that the, the traumas lives in the body. Um, but I think that's true of every, I think everything lives in the body, even, even not immense trauma. I mean, I think small things too. I don't know. I don't feel very articulate today because I just, I just woke up and I didn't sleep very well last night, but and it's in my body is <laughs> making it hard to be articulate. I am, uh, I'm in a study group that just started. If you guys are interested, it's on uh, integral life and, uh, um, Nomali Herrera is doing uh, a review of Wilbur's sex, ecology, and spirituality. I think I might have mentioned this at the last meeting that I was going to be doing this. So it, it has started. And Wilbur talks about that split between mind and body and also other matter where things that aren't human, you know, the earth and and uh, other matter that is not alive get got split off too. Um, and he attributes it to, you know, uh, the church and the church's teachings that they didn't want the body, which was not, not great uh, and sinful to be connected with the psyche, which is the soul. And so the church really promoted this sense of separation between the body and the mind, the body and the soul. And I think you're right, Beatrice, that it's starting to change. And that's probably because, you know, we're a lot more secular and we're not listening as much to those uh, tenets of the church about, you know, being sinful or our bodies being sinful. People just don't buy into that anymore. And, and science is catching up with the connection between the two. So it's pretty interesting. I always like learning about the the background, like how did this happen? You know, how did this emerge? Because probably certainly, you know, people millennia ago may not have felt that way. Um, there's certainly a lot of traditions where the body and the mind um, go hand in hand, uh, Native American for one. So it's interesting. It's interesting. So I think you're right. I think we're... Uh, we're beginning to drop that away and realize it's not necessary. Who knows how it is with other religions or with other parts of the world? Because it seems to me very Western centric. This uh, this um, analysis. Uh, is anybody know knows anything about Japan or China or Indonesia? How it is there? How how is their relationship with body and mind? Was Africa? You you have some uh, knowledge about Africa. Yeah, in Africa, um, the 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 division through the mind is not so much as in Western society, and it's it's a lot more integrated. They don't separate things like mind and heart. Oh, just apologies. I'm so sorry for this. My, my doggy doesn't, our doggy doesn't want to play with today. Sorry for that. In Africa, the, the spirit plays the biggest role. Traditionally now in, in indigenous cultures and the likes. So the split of and, and they are very sensitive to their instincts so the, and also to their bodies. So from that perspective, they it's very different from the rest of, you know, of Western society. But what I wanted to share about it, Heidi, is that we've I've been learning about a modality, which is a, 
where, which is linked to Ken Wilber's work as well, integral and many other things, where you really, when you experience a view, an opinion, for example, you go for a tour through your body, mind, heart, spirit, and your energy on an energetic level as well, to notice what it feels like and the expression of it. So you get an opportunity to express it mentally. You get an opportunity to express, to, to experience it physically. And you also get an, an opportunity to, to experience it on an emotional level as well as on an energetic level. So then you can see where there's blockages and why there are blockages. Then you can go deeper into it, but you never make a story about it. So it's never a story that you refer back to. You always go into the sense, into the feeling of what it feels like. And then, for example, I, you mentioned your shoulders, then it becomes clear on why, you know, you are sitting like this, you are protecting. Um, when you hear a specific view, a world view of somebody else or opinion of somebody else, you merely cringe, your body reacts before you even go into the mind to try to analyze what they've said and why you don't agree with it. And when, and when you work on the energetic level first, it goes beyond all those stories of whatever you thought, all those beliefs that you that you had. And then you can, through movement and sound and breath work, move through it, that, it, that you can release the blockage. It's really powerful work. It's very deep work, but it's really powerful. That's just one thing. And as a dancer myself, I agree with you, Beatrice. It's, you are so tuned to your body that the body remembers before anything. I totally... Uh, resonate with what you shared there that the body remembers before the incident even happens and it also then happens or also on that same level with things that's about to happen that you are feeling it already although you don't have a name for it yet but you, you feel it coming on and you don't label it yet so that by the time it does come into your awareness in your present moment awareness your body is sort of okay with it it doesn't go into flight fright or freeze because it felt it without identifying with it. And that's powerful because then the stories is what's creating lots of dissonance. So if, for example, let's talk about the AI thing. If the, if the bot has told us something beautiful because it collected all this information so very quickly to, to create those, those answers, or those possibilities, is to sense in with your body, what's happening in your body when you read it? Is, 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 is the body resonating? So your all your question, Monia, if it's how do you know if it's a bot or a you know um, somebody what what they call them I can't even remember what they call them now but you can see the same with your body if you resonate with that does that sound true to you and then that becomes the guide so you don't mentally analyze it and say is this true is it false news or false something false uh, is it there to distract me because the body will know and the heart will know. I don't know if that makes sense. And for me, if you look at where AI is going, it's also the, the, the emotional human part will always play precedence in the soul because it doesn't have a soul. It is very intelligent, but it doesn't have a soul. The body doesn't have a soul. It just collects information and bring it all together in a meaningful way. But it doesn't really have soul. So a human will always, we don't have to fear it because in my view, human will always uh, have something different, the soul. And it doesn't matter if AI starts to control things, we will still be able to, like somebody needs to program it anyway. So the human behavior is actually more important than anything else because somebody's programming it. And yes, it does develop by itself that it can start thinking for itself, but the starting point was a human being in the first place. So it's up to us on how we approach it now. We don't see it as an enemy. And it, like anything else in the world, we can use it for the good or for the bad. It's, it's, it's part of life. That's my two cents about that. My, my concern, like, I guess, along with other technologies, um, and I guess I'm thinking social media primarily, it's that it it evolves so quickly before we have a chance to catch up and know the effects and know what's happening. I mean, it's taken quite a while to understand social media and the detrimental aspects of it um, and to prove the detrimental aspects of it. And with AI, I have a feeling it's going to, you know, surpass our basic understanding of how it affects us, how we can interact with it, 
appropriately, how we can, you know, modify it. That's, that's the hard part. I think we can figure it out. It's kind of like climate change. It's like, it's happening so quickly, and we can figure a lot of things out about it. But is it happening too rapidly that we cannot keep up with? So that's my fear. Christine, I, for me, um, and I, I recognize and I acknowledge your fear, and it's quite valid. What comes up when you share it um, is that it, it turns us back to ourselves because we've gone a little bit away from ourselves as human beings, in my view. So I, it, it's like it's turning humanity back to itself, to start exploring ourselves much deeper that yes, there's this thing, and it might sound very scary at times of what's happening, like you say, it is happening so fast, but it's an opportunity for us to really turn back to, the, to our humanity, which I think we've got, we lost a little bit of connection to our souls and the soul of the world through what happened in our past. But our past doesn't have to hold us back. It can, it can be an indication for us to, to develop our human technology that we were born with an invitation for that along because I also I truly because I have a very strong technology background and if I look back in the when I entered that world in the 1990s I had no experience in it and it was very interesting how quickly I learned firstly but it was to see how my own life transformed because I was in that world I was part of that change of the internet coming to the world and and then social media later but at that time it was quite scary. I still remember crying at night because I thought I will never master this thing. It's just so big, and especially the part that I was involved in. But it happened so quick, and all the and if I look back at all the changes since, and the realization that the human factor, if innovation of any level, if it's not aligned with human innovation, then we are in trouble as a species, and we are a little bit beyond because that happened so quickly. So for me, still again, it takes me back to its opportunity for us to start exploring our human technology, what's in here. And that includes body, mind, heart, soul, everything. It's not just the mind or just a body or it's everything together, integrated version of who we are, totally fused. I don't know if that makes sense. But it gives me hope because it is like we, we needed the wake up call to turn back to ourselves. And social media is clearly showing that people need to speak. They, they have to explore and share openly because we didn't do that when I was young. But now there's opportunity for the younger generations and everybody for that matter to express how they feel about things. We couldn't do that 50 years ago or 30 years ago. We didn't have the platforms for it. We were in our little bubbles. So now we have opportunity to explore deeper and, and exp expand also our own perspectives to explore other possibilities. So it's, it's, it's hand in hand for me. It's not an either or. And I think if we can just always that our souls stay the center of it, we won't be in trouble. Well, that is a hopeful uh, outlook <laughs> and assumes that people are self-aware, which I'm not quite sure, but certainly a certain portion of the population is self-aware. So that would be, that would be great. <laughs> well, while listening to you, I was just wondering, something artificial intelligence doesn't have is a body. So maybe we will put more uh, value on the body after a certain time, because we can't compete mentally. They just, uh, it's not possible. They are, it's much fast. It's so fast, it's, it's incomprehensible almost. But human beings have a body. And that's why they uh, create the robots when they, they put them in, in bodies, because they have understood it too, mm -hmm. that uh, AI and robots, which are not like, have no body, is not, not, have no, no effect. I read this article about that, that they are trying to imitate human bodies or animal bodies or whatever it is, you know. Uh, Hanili, you wrote kinesthetic intelligence. Yes, Beatrice will know too. It's it's our muscular intelligence of our bodies. 
it's really powerful. Athletes and gymnasts and dancers have been using it for decades to practice and to to be, you know, to improve their performance and the likes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And once you experience that physically, because it's a very physical thing, it's a very sensory thing. When you start tapping into that, mm -hmm. that intelligence that you receive through that body, through that system is in extraordinary. So it's all these things that we that we have not much, we've not, never learned about it. It was a part of the population who were actually aware of it or using it. But now we are in a space where it's available to everybody. And we can develop and improve those abilities. This, this is one of them. I'm just giving one of them this. We, when we play with people, we play with 42 intelligences. And it's incredible when you, when you expose people to some of these intelligence because it's inborn. It's not something, it's not learned. It's inborn. It's who we are. We're born like that. So I, that's why I have so much hope for us because we haven't tapped into those, those worlds at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really untouched. And when you start putting it all together, it's, 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 there's a totality about it that no, no, nothing or nobody can take away from us. And it really shifts our energy immediately and our perspectives to another state of being as well when we start playing with them. All right, now I'm just wondering, because I'm, uh, I'm a book person and I like the feeling of paper and pages. And I was wondering if Kindle also is something to make you less haptic and just stay in your mind. So I don't have Kindle, it's just for several reasons, but yeah. So this is uh, something we'll, we really have to concentrate on to stay human. Hello, Victoria. Nice that you came. And we are talking about artificial intelligent, intelligence and what's the difference of being human or what is missing to that or what we still have in advantage, as uh, Haneli said, we have the kinesthetic intelligence and that a robot uh, has no feelings. I mean, he's, they are talking about a chat service. You can ask questions and immediately you get the most sophisticated answers. But do you think when we ask the, this chat that we want the dance the Swan Lake um, Ballet, that they can do it for you? I don't know. <laughs> or, or, or Stravinsky violin uh, um, pieces. Have you done the, your, your concerts? Yeah, it was yesterday. Ah, good. Did yeah. it go well? Um, apparently it went really well. Yeah, I, I got a couple of standing ovations. So that was, I guess, a good sign. <laughs> So I, AI, I always... until AI arrives uh, to, to play together with you and we find out who is better at the violin, I think it will take, I hope it will take some time. <laughs> well, did Beatrice tell you about um, about her father's um, article for the Millennium? Okay, because he was, he was commissioned... Um, to write an article, because he was such a prominent art historian, he was commissioned to write an article about his, in, in at the end of 1999, about his predictions for the new millennium in terms of how, um, how, how would art be affected by, by, you know, all the changes in the world and technology particularly. And so he wrote, um, his article was about what he called the difference between information society and experiential society or intuitive, I think he called it. I, and I, I have to look up the article, but um, but he used as an example, it was very interesting. Um, we, that year, 1999, two major museums opened the same year, um, the new Getty Museum in Los Angeles and the um, Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. Um, both American architects, um, Richard Meyer in the Getty and um, Frank Gehry for the Bilbao. Um, but the two architects for, for Conrad, for my late husband, for Beatrice's father, represented these two different ways of looking at the world as artists. And what Conrad actually predicted, and I, I think, well, I don't know, we can talk about it, it'd be interesting, um, 
he felt that that the information society would kind of play itself out because people would be longing so much for human contact and for something that was really visceral and for real experience that that the humanity of people would begin to become starved starved and so information technology would start losing its its um influence after a certain period of time he he saw that i mean that was what he predicted and i don't know you know we'll see what happens but um but he was very um oh here's Hanali saying about the lockdown yeah anyway i don't want to talk too much because i know i'm coming in i'm sorry i had i had a a meeting i had to attend at nine o'clock so i i couldn't come till now but i'm glad to be here anyway i think yeah it's an interesting question very much Heidi, what do you think about all of this? Me? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> I can say I think both. I think still think that the information uh, area of societies, they will still go on, but they will sort of butcher themselves, you know, because all the dangers which are coming uh, with also social media with the censorship and then the propaganda and the the uh, so how did you call this um, what in publicity uh, what they use in in publicity um this is manipulation and sooner or later uh, all people will understand that and don't want it anymore and then we come into this what you are talking about i think then people understand that the price they are paying for for these things and then we come back to to human relationships i think the lockdowns i think they have done something but first of all they have also created the the, the separation between people you know between people who think it in one way and the people who think it in the other way and who are believing in the politicians and who are these uh, who have lost all uh, faith in politicians or in medicine or whatever. So first we are still, in my opinion, in the separation phase. But I think um, it will come what you say, uh, Victoria. Maybe not next year, next year or, or next week or something, but it will take a little longer, but also because what you were saying that it's missing the emotional uh, part in AI and that gives me hope that we won't be uh, dominated by it at the long run, you know. Some parts of it, of us, yes, but not the whole human being. I don't think uh, you can do that. I was thinking about, um, you know, I lived very near East Germany and I then later in, Be in West Berlin, and then we went often into the East. So I could uh, understand and experience what a totalitarian state is like, which tries to dominate <laughs> the people and direct the thought into one direction and so on. But I also realized that people find a way, they get in the news certain things to hear and they know what, what to listen for, or what not to believe and, and to to, to read in <clears throat> in the newspapers, you say between the the lines, you know, and um, and they found their way to 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 get their life done. In a, you know, it it went like this. I remember when I was in with our relatives, he was a pharmacist, and he had uh, meat under his uh, for us. We were guests. He had it in in his pharmacy. Somebody brought him the meat, and he uh, exchanged it for something else. You know, because you couldn't just go into the shops and buy what you wanted to buy because it wasn't there. So I'm confident that humans, whatever challenge comes, they will find a way to <laughs> subvert it in some way and 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 find their way through it. And at the end, yes, it will. We will come to a better situation who knows how long it takes but i'm quite confident that i wonder idea. if uh, artificial intelligence could be programmed like that to find a way <laughs> yeah but then somebody else is programming it and not you you it's not your way of doing it will be somebody else's way of doing that what i was always so cross with uh, using computers i i thought 
I have to think like the programmer thinks, you know, and I, I want to think my own way. Now you get used so much to this way, how to do yeah. click here, click there. But at the beginning, I refused it for this, but why, it's not logic for me, what, for me, what they were doing, what they were asking us. At the beginning was even much more difficult, you know, with the computer, so. I have to leave because we have another, I have another Zoom group for three hours now coming <laughs> and yeah okay wish you do you want to shortly say a summary of of your no it's just it's just opening up okay. so the chat groups is gtp tpt uh i haven't used it yet mm -hmm. but i was very impressed if you uh, the way you can ask questions and get reasonable replies so it's about uh, we call it matura niveau, so it's about eighth grade or, or, or I don't know, but the language is terrific. So the, the, it's really like, a, not like a robot, it's like a person that answers. Mm -hmm. uh, so children except, won't have to do their homework anymore, basically. Exactly. Right. Right, right, right. They just the ask the question, get the answer, and they won't have to do it. Okay. <laughs> And they lose all the capacities of thinking themselves. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, when I studied linguistic, it was just the start of this trying to 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 create language and trying to create it in the right way. So it has come along a very far way. You know, it's really amazing what they found out. That's good. Okay. So my, my wrap up is. Uh... This is, we'll be continuing this topic. I guess. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah. I was just going to say that um, we, we spent two years in Japan from 2000 to 2002. And during those two years, the, the changes were so rapid due to technology um, that it, it went from um people being a you know the children Beatrice was in in elementary school and so she was learning to write all the Japanese characters the kanji um they had calligraphy and it was very traditional but in the um in the higher grades in those two years I found out from um you know students that we knew um the the Kids were forgetting all the kanji, and and the higher the grade, the more they forgot because um, because they knew you know their their vocabulary was so good they could just look up the word type using our alphabet on the computer mm -hmm. pad uh, to, and um, and and then scroll through the options like if the word was she which they're like a billion she's I mean s h i um, they but they would know because they would have the big vocabulary they would know which one they were looking for and then they would just type it so so uh, gradually the japanese are losing the capacity to handwrite anything because they're they're not being trained after the lower grades like elementary school and they don't they don't maintain it because they don't have to because the computer can do it all and um and then it's even worse of course if you dictate then you're not looking at anything um, just you just say the sentence and and the app knows which she like if it was something like that that has a billion meanings um, the computer knows by context what which one it is so they predicted that Japanese is going to you know become this this very um, I don't know this is basically and die out as a as a real language in 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 as a written language um, because because there's not there's no connection to it anymore. It's just it's it's all it's like typing in numbers. Um, so it's it's very disturbing because of course, fortunately for us with our alphabet, which is so short, um, you know, I don't think we'll ever lose the capacity to be able to write by hand. But it's uh, very yeah, it's different in Asia. Yeah. yeah, I want to say also the mathematics. Now in my when we grew up, we still had to calculate in the mind. And now there are situations like the German foreign minister. She, when we, we they were talking about seventy five percent of something, da, 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 and she said, and maybe also two thirds. You know, uh, if you don't realize these things, or in the shop when you when uh, when you cannot 
calculate um, at least a little bit in your mind what the items uh, uh, they they can ask you all all prices they want you know and the the children don't don't learn anymore to calculate in their heads five by five they 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 look into their cell phone to find out that it's 25 or something you know that's for me it's um impoverishment of our abilities and these are for me they are crucial abilities also when you lose your calligraphy like in Japan you have no possibility to know your history because you have no possibility to read it anymore no what what uh, people have written before you so that's all what I hope that will be reversed in some way that will come some renaissance no of of uh, of uh, finding going back to the to the roots let's say in some way which doesn't mean to to abandon the other completely but use it where it is needed and not as a whole universe you know that the computer becomes the only thing i don't think it's the right thing anyway i'm grateful that we are here via computer but <laughs> Well, we were at a restaurant um, at Christmas time and um, the, the computers went down in the restaurant and the table next to us got a free meal because um, he, the guy didn't have any, um, any cash and they couldn't use the credit card because they, they couldn't process it. And so, <laughs> so he and his wife just walked out and, and I said to my friend, I said, oh, it's too bad that, you know, we're just out of the window. Like our check came like 10 minutes after they got their computers back. So. But I just thought that's typical. Like they, you know, I mean, we're we're so dependent on these machines that um, no one can do any business if something happens. You cannot buy your food, or so the supermarket is full, but you cannot check out and pay if these things don't work anymore. No? That's absurd. <laughs> So I don't know how you feel, but it might be time to do a little summary, a little check out and have done a whole hour. It's incredible how quickly time passes. Thank you. I really enjoyed like all these threads and Beatrice, you with um, this, this century of the soul. I was just, you know, it's wonderful that I just saw it and you, you had that project and because that made me think as well because they were they were honing in on the desires of human beings of using it against us so in if you now look at ai it made me thought of what desire of us will not be fulfilled by it you know currently what desires does it fulfill and which ones won't be fulfilled and maybe that's the the core of it of where it's going of us staying connected to our humanity and our souls and our other intelligences. So that's also making me hopeful that there is, even in that sense, if we can break that pattern. Because like you said, Beatrice, it's not old. It's PR is not the old thing. It's previous century. And um, how things quickly come into play. And I was just quickly trying to look up when the English language became the, like the global language choice and it's not that long ago either so it's things are rapidly changing it could change in our lifetimes to some especially in yours Beatrice to something completely different from what we know today and I'm curious about what that will be so that's what I'm fascinated about thank you ladies lots of love well it's a pro provocative uh session today lots lots to think about and uh yeah I'll, I'll enjoy thinking about it for the rest of the day and beyond so thank you for all your shares and um i'm good i'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks yeah thank you yeah thank you everybody i always like i don't like waking up early but i like waking up early to see all of you so <laughs> I'm always happy I did it. <laughs> and uh, 
here's hoping we can all have a good mind body connection the next two weeks and really pay attention to what the body is telling us as well as the mind. I'm, I'm glad I got, um, got to participate for a few minutes and, um, yeah, I, th I think Monia is right. It, there's, we can continue this theme because it has so many different applications. Um, I think even the mindfulness movement um, that's growing so rapidly has to do with people getting tired of being disconnected from their bodies and trying to get become human again. So thank you. Thanks. For, sorry for the interruption of me coming in late, but it was unavoidable due to technology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so look forward to seeing you soon. I, yeah. I just wanted to add a, uh, a thank you. Uh, congratulations, Victoria, on your performance. I just wanted to add that. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you could have come. You have no excuse. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding I, but... I, wanted, I wanted to come. Sunday afternoons is not a good time for me, but I did. I did consider coming. You're right. You're right. <laughs> no, but thank you for the congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, and I thank you for being here with me. I mean, Women Matters, we are now doing it, I think this is sixth or seventh year or something like that. And we are still going on and that's very important for me. Not only because I have to talk in English nowadays, which I'm about to lose, <laughs> but you know, what is so fascinating for me is all the locations where we are and the different perspectives we have because of because of that, you know, and thank you. And see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. <laughs>